It's early in the morning on Thursday, November 5th. America is still waiting to find out who has won the race for president. We had no idea how it would go just a few days ago when I was saying goodbye to my family in Brooklyn, about to leave them for the first time in seven months. All right, my love, I will see you when I get back. Love you, Peter Paskis. I love you. I will, baby. <laughs> you be good, sweetie. You be good for mommy, okay? I have to leave, baby. I gotta do this. <laughs> I love you, sweetie. And I will see you when I get back. Love you. Love you, too. Safe travels. Thank you. I'm Tremaine Lee. This is Into America. All right, everything is loaded up. In 1.7 miles, turn left on Columbia Street. And on this episode, for the first time since coronavirus hit, Saturday morning, 11.50 a.m., and I'm headed to, to North Carolina with a stop in between in uh, Falls Church, Virginia, where I'll stay tonight. I'm leaving New York and really going into America. Usually, getting out of New York is like the hardest part, but right now it's pretty smooth. Why North Carolina? The stakes were so high and the race was so tight. Just days before the election, Donald Trump and Joe Biden were nearly tied in the polls and the state's 15 electoral votes were still up for grabs. And it's crazy, this whole routine now. I had, before COVID, I was traveling maybe every other week. I was on the road a lot. I was in and out of rental cars, in and out of airplanes and hotels. And to be back on the road um, after nine months just feels like odd. <laughs> like I'm, I'm a little nervous and I'm excited. The black turnout is gonna be, be crucial, right? It's gonna be interesting to see how things actually shape up in North Carolina. Where I'm headed is, is, is poised to be critical in this. Right? You know, Red light winner. camera reported ahead. So got into Virginia uh, about 10 minutes ago. Um, and the sign says Virginia is for lovers. I always thought that was a little weird, but okay, I see you, Virginia. All right, let's get this show on the road. Four and a half hours to Greensboro. And it is a pretty nasty day out here. It's wet and rainy and just nasty. I finally made it to Greensboro. It stopped pouring and my first destination on Monday was a proud HBCU, the biggest historically black university in America. North Carolina a and I wanted to talk to young voters here. So here we go. All righty. It's Monday. What time is it? It's uh, Monday, November 2nd, 1016. It's hard to uh, believe we're, we're so close to the election. Let's get started. Drive safely. Excuse me, sir. How you doing? I'm looking for the uh, the Greensboro Four statue. Okay. Okay. All right. Just pulling into the North Carolina A&T campus. The Greensboro Four is this like kind of legendary uh, group of young men who are part of uh, these protests that desegregate lunch counters. And there was this famous kind of standoff at, uh, at downtown Woolworths. And so often it was young people who led the way. Ben Boha. Ah, there we go. I see it. Perfect. And the parking spot is pretty close, too. Right, let's take a walk around and see what's going on out of here. I don't know if it's because I'm in the South or what it is, but this air just just smells nice <laughs> this air just feels cool and crisp um and here we are i see this amazing statue outside of uh dudley hall it's four young men standing tall literally 
above campus. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Under the shadow of those four black men, I spoke to four black women. Miss this, what makes North Carolina a and special? What is it about this campus? Aggie Aggie pride. Aggie pride. Aggie pride. Aggie pride. We don't got no time. We don't got no time. ring in our name. When you yes. hear North Carolina a and like we're the ones who are really seeking the change in the system. We are the leaders of tomorrow. Ryan Gray, Sydney Joyner, Brittany Isopone, and Anukit Mangum are anti-students and organizers with Black Girls Vote. Right now, we have over 50 active members. Um, Black Girls Vote, we're a national nonpartisan organization. So what we do, we encourage African-American women to utilize their voice in the political process and seek change in the system. Mm -hmm. They were so excited to see us in front of the student center and get out and vote. So we got a lot of students to get out and vote, and they were excited, so I was excited. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to to have, again, excitement around Mm -hmm. an election. That's not normally the thing that a lot of young people on college campuses are concerned about. That's what we're all about. We're all about breaking those barriers and killing those status quo and just bridging those generational gaps. But yeah. Carrying on what our ancestors started, like we're trying to build for the next generation. What, what does that mean to be on this campus especially? Right now when we look over, we see that, that beautiful statue of the Greensboro Four and what they meant for civil rights and for America, right? right. What does it mean to be on this campus, your feet on this, on this ground, and pushing? What does it mean? We're definitely walking on hollow grounds. Like, we are the spinning image of our ancestors. So the sit-ins that they've done, we've done marches to the polls. We're also um, downtown leading the Black Lives Matter movement. Just seeing a statue, I think it empowers me to move every day and noticing that our ancestors did do the same thing that we do, and, like, we have to hold that legacy. We know with black folks especially, we've been fighting for the right to vote. There have been voter suppression efforts since, since the beginning, right? And North Carolina has a special history. You know, the state has acted with surgical precision targeting black voters for disenfranchisement. How much of that do you think is still going on? Is that still an issue? Wow. That is still an issue today. I was actually speaking with my friend. She was saying her mom had to go to a surrounding neighborhood where she only had to wait about 20 minutes to vote, where here our lines was down the street. You had to wait hours to vote. But... We can't let that fear us. We can't let them put the fear in our heart and say, like, who's to say their vote is more important than my vote? Because that does work, right? You see the wrong lines, you see, and you say, you know, the system is going to be geared against us anyway, so what can we do? Right? What can we do? We can vote. We can vote. Um, We can tell our friends to vote. We can tell our mama to vote. We can tell um, big mama to vote. We can tell everybody we know to vote. Just as quick as word can get around of a celebrity or something like that, we need to take the same things as serious in our system instead of just complaining about it. Well, thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been been inspiring. I'm excited now. Thank you very much. Aggie Pride. Yeah, Aggie Pride. So you might have heard me referring to a phrase, surgical precision, when it comes to voter suppression and and black voters here in North Carolina. Back in 2013, North Carolina passed a whole bunch of changes to its election laws, led mostly by the Republican-led legislature. And the really big one was requiring photo ID at the polls. Okay, the supposed reason for voter ID was to combat voter fraud, but that actually almost never, ever happens. And so there was a big court fight, and ultimately the voter ID law was struck down. And that's where this term, surgical precision, that's where it comes from. The appeals court said the law was intentionally designed to discriminate against black people by targeting African Americans with, quote, almost surgical precision. For black people, everything is on the line. Also on campus, I met Julian Woods, who's a sophomore at a and Everything that we've seen in this year since January from COVID and how it's disproportionately hit the black community, black workers are more likely to be essential workers. I am the son of an essential worker myself. So I know that from the economic standpoint, that's a big issue. Um, from the healthcare standpoint and the pandemic, um, from the social justice with George Floyd and the police brutality, and even the videos that we've seen since George Floyd. And so I think that it's important for us to make our voices heard so we can push back on these crises so that we don't have to live in a state of constant fear. 
What, what does it mean to be kind of emerging in this moment as young uh, black voters? Is it a sense of, of power or powerlessness? I think I would say it's a sense of power because, I mean, we know that just to occupy space in America as a black person is inherently political. Um, so the fact that we are still doing it and still thriving in spite of the challenges that Donald Trump and so many others have put in our way is so important. So I think that's what the election is really about for black voters and young black voters saying that we can face the biggest, baddest, darkest person and his entire infrastructure and we can still beat him. It's Monday, November 2nd. It's about 7.30 p.m. And I'm finally back at the hotel. Uh, it's been a pretty long day today. Um, and in some ways, it was, a, it was a great day. You know, that's, that's, that's a reminder sometimes that, you know what, maybe we will actually be okay. <laughs> like, may, maybe, just maybe, the future is in good hands. Um, and I think about black people in this country who fought so hard to hold America to be what it says it's been. And we know that so much of what America is is based on hypocrisy, right? But there, there, there is, I think, somewhere in its core that it wants to be what it says it is. And normally at, this, at a time like this, I'd be sitting back at the end of a long day with some some uh, some whiskey, some bourbon. Um, <laughs> but instead, I am drinking hot chamomile tea. I just want my immune system to be kind of, you know, tough. I've been outside. I've been around more people than I've been around in a very long time. And so I'm just getting ready for, for what could be a very, very long day. And we will see what happens. Um, we will see what happens. So we'll see what happens after a quick break. It's Tuesday, November 3rd, election day. And I hate when people liken uh, politics to like sports because it's not a game at all, right? It's like life and death. But this does kind of feel like the Super Bowl. I'll be headed to uh, a few spots here in North Carolina. I'll be going to uh, a polling location in uh, Durham. I'm just getting dressed and getting ready, going over some last minute prep. And then I'll be, um, you know, hitting the streets. So there we go. So I'm walking up to the Durham County Main Library now and there aren't a whole bunch of people out here, but you do see folks with a uh, little table set up. Again, the big question is, with so many people who voted early, uh, how many will be doing a same day voting? And that will be a key question, especially when it comes to black turnout. We'll see. In front of the library, I met Robert and Reva Page. So you all, uh, did you vote today or you, did you vote early? October 15th, the first day of early voting. But there's COVID going around. I didn't know I was going to be around today. <laughs> I wanted my vote in early, just in case something happened. You know, now I'm not trying to talk that thing up. Yeah, of course. But I said, there's COVID going around. I want to make sure my vote is in there early, just in case. And have y'all been lifelong North Carolina residents? I was born and reared here. They had already voted, but came out to the polls to help a family member who was having some trouble walking. Now, while the students I talked to on Monday were confident in a Biden victory, these two were more cautious. Do you think that, um, you know, North Carolina will go to Biden or Trump this time around? What do you think? Well, my knees are rough. I'm praying <laughs> to go for Biden. <laughs> my knees are rough. But from what I see, for all the rallies, I'm not too confident. And I didn't see that excitement when Biden and Kamala Harris came. That, that, that boom wasn't out there, the oomph wasn't there. I see more oomph on the, on the other side. Man, what do you think? Do you think uh, Biden has a chance here, or do you think it's... It's going to be a battle. And I just hope it turns out the way we're expecting it to turn out. I can't take four more years of this guy, 
period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm almost well, I'm 68 years old next birthday. I don't know how many more years I have left. I cannot live under this kind of stress. I won't do it. Well, how important is it, given uh, the history of how much fighting and bloodshed and, and pushing for the right to vote, how important is it, do you think, black folks exercise their right? Because we saw from 2012 to 2016, there was a big drop-off once Obama wasn't on, and we see what happens. People lost their lives for us to have the right to vote. Why would you not vote? We couldn't sit down and eat at Rose's department store when I grew up here. And, and we fought the vote of suppression. So I'm a part of that history. Yeah. You know, uh, last election, one of my sons didn't vote because he wanted Bernie Sanders. He didn't vote at all. Wow. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, you have to vote. I turned my mic off and then asked the pages one more question. Did their son, who stayed home in 2016, vote this time around? They told me they don't know. They're afraid to ask. So it's election day around 4.30, uh, and I'm headed back to Greensboro from Durham. So just as, as kind of more context, Obama won North Carolina in 2008, and it was the first uh, GOP loss since 1976. But second time around in 2012, he lost to Mitt Romney, and then Trump won in 2016. So Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are trying to uh, regain some of that, that blue magic that Obama experienced. So it's seven o'clock on election night, but outside this old courthouse in Greensboro, uh, they'll be counting all of Guilford County's ballots. So I'm hoping to, to get a chance to get in there. But again, Less than an hour later, they let me inside. So I'm inside the old courthouse outside of uh, a room. It looks like an old school kind of conference room. It's called the Blue Room. And inside there are about seven uh, elections officials, all kind of in a a semi-circle, half moon, uh, waiting for the results to just come in, start start being tabulated. Uh, Some are on their cell phones. One guy is reading a book. This is how uh, democracy happens in these very small ways. That's where I met Charlie Collicutt. He's in charge of making sure the process works. Uh, director of the Guilford County Board of Elections. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, this is the big day. It is. <laughs> it is. This is the, we're almost there. Yeah. Come on down here with me down to the basement. So what we're going to go see is all the cars coming in. Okay. So they're actually bringing in all the uh, tabulations from? All their tabulated results, all their ballots, provisional ballots. All the signed paperwork where everybody's checked in and voted. He's got a handful of results right there. Wow. So this is there. They're actually coming in here. Yeah, this is under the building we were just in. Okay. And you can see them coming in over there. Wow. This is like a whole operation. Let me get out of her way. (laughs) Pardon me. Wow, this is great. So how long will this be going on for? Until the last one comes through, hopefully, hopefully about 10, you know, I don't know, 10 o'clock, I don't really know. Yes. We need you at 10 o'clock. All right, we're down here, like, in the basement right, level. Right All right, thank you. We're here in the basement level. There are a bunch of cars coming in. Again, these are vehicles coming in from all across the county with the actual ballot results. And so you see uh, people popping their trunks, loading uh, zip bags uh, into big trash cans on wheels. This is what we don't typically see. We tune into the television, right, and we see the results streaming in. But this is how it happens all across the country. This is what's going on. And again, upstairs, the the scene is completely different, right? They're they're quiet. Uh, But down here, there's actually action happening. So how, how, how many of these have you experienced? I've been, I've been doing elections here in Guilford County for 17 years. Wow. My first presidential was 2004. Okay. Yeah. And it's, um, everyone has been different. This has been tough. It's been a tough election, um, trying to coordinate just normal presidential stuff on top of pandemic is hard. You know, we're, we're having to deal with supply chains and logistics and, and hand sanitizer quantities when we're still trying to plan on how many ballots we need 
precinct official training and all that, and it's just a lot. It's just a lot. And early voting here in North Carolina is 17 days, and we went nonstop. And it's just that's, amazing. that's amazing. Yeah. Do you start to get nervous the day, election day? Like, is there, is there like a whole routine that you go oh, through? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Election day, I, I do get nervous. I mean, I can't even hardly sit down at my desk. You know, I have this, I have this nervous energy that just goes the whole time. And, um, you know, probably too much caffeine and all that. But, um, you know, I used to not sleep at all the night before an election, but now I just, I'm just so exhausted from everything that I do. My wife will be ready for me to take some time off. So, so what happens next for you? Obviously, you're still, you have a 10-day period, right, where things, yeah. the canvassing period? Yeah, we have a 10-day period here where we're going to keep taking ballots that um, get received, um, you know, postmarked by Election Day, and, and we're going to be processing them, processing provisionals. We do a ton of audits, you know, auditing, 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 and, and um, that's what we'll do for the next 10 days. So it's 10.54, uh, the election in um, North Carolina. The tally is still too close to call. Uh, I'm looking like I'm outside now. I had to take a, a breather. That's the longest I've, I've been inside a building with people <laughs> in a very long time. So I decided to come out and get some fresh air. And this is uh, nerve-wracking, I guess it, it is. I haven't allowed myself to kind of steep in all of the possibilities and implications of of election 2020 uh i guess it's kind of surprisingly but i've tried to stay arm's length just so i can just kind of focus and, and tell the story but um it's going to be interesting how tomorrow and the next day and the rest of this week actually turns out and what it will say about who we are and who we want to be and I've said it before and it's probably not like a broken record but what is what does a second term Donald Trump president say about us I don't know if I'll I'll sleep tonight because it's already 11 o'clock we'll see and my battery is just about dead so <laughs> this might be good night So it's Wednesday, November 4th, 7.15 a.m. I didn't go to bed last night until about 2.30. I was laying there in, in between consciousness and unconsciousness. And, and for a moment there, I just felt completely at peace like blissfully so I haven't turned on a TV I haven't opened up my email I have no idea what might have happened politically between the time I went to bed just a few hours ago and right now and there's something so uh, <laughs> blissful in that ignorant state because now it's about to end. There's no anxiety, no weight, no stress, no nothing. Just uh, savoring the last minutes before I got to open my eyes, let the light in, literally and figuratively, and see what's going on. But that's about to end. Because I have to get myself together. <sighs> All right. Well, those moments of bliss didn't last long. A lot is still unfolding. Both Biden and Trump addressed America during the night with very different messages. We believe we're on track to win this election. We're going to have to be patient until we, uh, the hard work of tallying the votes is finished. And it ain't over till every vote is counted. Every ballot is counted. 
This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. With millions of votes still to be counted, Trump's claim to victory just isn't true. On Wednesday at 10.15 a.m., as I record this, first, in the Electoral College, 270 votes are needed to win. Joe Biden stands at 238, Donald Trump, 213. But what really matters most at this point, seven key states, including North Carolina, are still counting votes. They're up for grabs, and it could take days, maybe weeks, to know the results. So it's still a razor thin race. The margin between Joe Biden and Donald Trump is still super slim. And I wanted to catch back up with Ryan Gray. Y'all might remember her. She was one of the young students I met at North Carolina A&T University in Greensboro. She was super excited. She was organizing her classmates with the group Black Girls Vote. So I had to see how she was feeling. Wow, right now the feel, our feelings are so overwhelmed. And I feel like that's important that we all need to realize that we need to keep that level balance. Like, yeah. ooh, a lot of students are going crazy. So I definitely feel like emotions are skyrocketing because everyone's just anticipating. Like we're just waiting for the biggest news of our lives right now. Basically. But are you prepared? I mean, this is generally a red state. If Biden pulls it off, you see how close it is now. Right. Um, are you ready for, you know, North Carolina maybe going Trump? I think what we can be ready for is next election. So now we learn. I feel like more awareness was brought to the whole electoral process and how to vote. So I definitely say though that was shocker. And I it made me realize that we need everyone on deck. Like every vote matters. And we see it's so close. Tell me about how you uh, were watching the returns coming in. Ooh, when I was watching the returns, I was making Taco Tuesdays. I was in there, oh no, screaming. And then the onions, when I was cutting the onions, I was crying. So, I mean, it's the onions, but I am upset though. <laughs> I was going through so many emotions during those elections. I definitely had the ups and downs. But right now, you know, in this limbo, are you feeling more hopeful or more like anxious and worried? I see, I'm getting a little 50-50. I'm feeling hopeful. And I'm feeling that, I wouldn't say the job is done, but I'm feeling like, who a weight could be, it's lifted off my shoulder a little bit. As long as we know that we really showed up and showed out and did that all we can do. And I feel like our generation, it's our time. It's our time. And I want to be able to make my mom proud, my dad proud, make the Lord proud. So it's like, I feel like it's our time to really just step up to the plate and start swinging. Even if we miss, we got to keep swinging. It's Wednesday, about 8 p.m., the day after the election, and we still don't have a clear winner. But it's looking most probable that Joe Biden will be elected the next president of the United States. But here in North Carolina, which is still in play, the margin between Joe Biden and Donald Trump is just tens of thousands. Yet elections officials tell us that we won't know a true count from North Carolina for at least another week. But North Carolina might not end up being as important to the election as it had been just two days ago. Joe Biden has won Wisconsin, and he's won Michigan. And now Arizona is leaning Biden. Nevada is leaning Biden. We might not know tonight, but by the time you're listening, if he clinches... Arizona and Nevada, that's a wrap, folks. So we'll see. Here we are in North Carolina. And soon I will be back in New York. But I've enjoyed coming out into America. (laughs) Like I did that. (laughs) Be well. Into America is produced by Isabel Angel, Allison Bailey, 
Aaron Dalton, Max Jacobs, Barbara Rabb, Claire Tai, Aisha Turner, and Preeti Varathan. Original music by Hannes Brown. Our executive producer is Ellen Frankman. A special shout out and thank you this week to producer Mary Flume. I'm Tremaine Lee. We'll be back next Thursday. <laughs>